<clears throat> this is Michael Langford and Regina Don Akers, recording number one. If you hear silent pauses during this recording, please use the time to reflect on what has been said. I want to begin by talking about the human mind and by human mind I mean thought, thinking, ideas, beliefs, concepts. The thoughts that we think are from the language that we have learned. And that language came from the outside. That's the reason why you can't speak fluently in 150 different languages because it comes from the outside, you have to learn it. So whatever language you think in, if you think in English, for example, it had to come from the outside. You existed before you learned the language you now think in. Therefore, you are not your thoughts. But thought pretends to be I. Thought says, I, I am such and such. So a false identity has arisen. You know you are not that false identity because you existed before you learned those thoughts. That false identity, which is made up of thinking, wishes to continue. It does not want its host to find out that it is not oneself, one's true self. And thought has millions of tricks available to it. In order to continue in order to preserve its imaginary self. It has as many strategies and tricks and methods to preserve its imaginary self as there are possible combinations of thoughts, feelings, desires, thoughts, ideas, beliefs, concepts. Think of how many different combinations they can come in. There are millions of possibilities. That false identity, which is thinking, which is the human mind, has been very successful in continuing for almost every human throughout all of human history. The human mind is made of thousands of layers of self-deception. 
And those layers of self-deception are not aware of each other. Those layers of self-deception hide from each other. <clears throat> so a person can go their whole lives and never be aware of these layers of self-deception. I want to bring up now why does all this matter? What difference does it make? What's the significance of this? Okay, so what? There's a false identity. What is the significance of this? Why does all this matter at all? And the reason why it matters is because this false identity will continue into the indefinite future if it's not brought to a final end. This false identity will have trillions of future incarnations. It will be reborn in future imaginary lifetimes. Now, using that word imaginary, one must understand that this also is an imaginary lifetime. And just as this human lifetime seems very real to a human, those future imaginary lifetimes are going to seem just as real as this one. And there are so many forms of sorrow and suffering that this false identity will go through in those lifetimes. In the last 5,000 years, there have been more than 15,000 wars. And that's an example of one type of sorrow and suffering. There are so many thousands of diseases the body is subject to. And there is violence that does not occur in a war. Today, on the day that you who are listening to this, on this day, the day that you're listening to this, there will be more than a billion acts of violence. More than a billion human beings will commit an act of verbal or physical violence on another human being. The reason for all of this is because the human mind is something false. It is possible to not have to go through any of those future imaginary lifetimes, those trillions and trillions of future imaginary lifetimes. It is possible to never have to go through any sorrow or suffering again. But it is only possible if the false identity is brought to a final end.
And that false identity doesn't want to end. What remains when the false identity is brought to a final end can be described as absolutely perfect, infinite, eternal, awareness, love, bliss. And that is an infinitely better choice than to continue in a false identity. It is an infinitely better choice than to continue with all of the sorrows and suffering that the human identity will bring. So the reason this teaching is being presented is because there are very, very, very rare humans. Who would like to bring the false identity to a final end? in whom the desire to bring that false identity to a final end is greater than the desire to continue the false identity. There are humans, very rare humans, who really do not want to continue the false identity, human sorrow, and not only because of the sorrow and the potential sorrow, but because of a desire for that which is true. Not true according to some human perspective or human idea of belief or concept about what is true, but they would like to know the eternal truth which is very different from the concept eternal truth, which is very different from the, from the idea eternal truth. They want to know truth for truth's sake. And in order to assist those rare ones in bringing the false identity to a final end, and to assist them in bringing sorrow and suffering to a final end, and to assist them in how to know the true identity, this teaching is being presented. It's worthwhile now to take a good look at how 
the human mind will receive such a teaching. For all of human history, the human mind of almost every human has successfully blocked all attempts to penetrate those thousands of layers of self-deception. It has been very successful, almost always successful, almost without exception. Therefore, one knows that any teaching that is truly aimed at bringing the false identity to a final end is going to be blocked. It's going to be blocked by the human mind. The ways it can be blocked are almost endless. But an example is simply disagreeing with it. Saying, well, it isn't so, it isn't true. Another way to block receiving the teaching. is to change the teaching, to interpret the teaching so it has a different meaning than what's being presented. And that's a very common way a very common way to block the teaching from being received. So it's a good exercise to be aware to ask oneself, am I changing what I'm hearing? Or are my own thoughts about what I'm hearing? Are those, are those what you, the listener, are really hearing? Are you hearing your own thoughts, your own ideas? Your own beliefs, your own concepts, your own interpretations? It is possible for the false human identity to be brought to a final end. It's very rare that that happens. There may be less than one out of every 500 million humans who has brought the false identity to a final end. It can happen. In terms of what the solution to all of these thousands of layers of self-deception is, the solution is the awakening of the extremely intense desire for freedom, 
And that's a subject that we can go into later, what that is. But that's the primary solution. The spiritual and religious teachings of the past are not separate from the human false identity. The spiritual and religious teachings of the past are helping the false identity to continue. In some cases, the spiritual and religious teachings of the past were created by one in whom the illusion of the ego had come to its final end. However, the moment the listener heard such a teaching, instantly, that very moment, that very instant, the teaching was changed into something that would make the false identity continue. That second it was changed, right the moment it was heard, that instant it was changed by the human mind. So there have been some valid teachings in the past, but that's what happens to them. Those valid teachings are immediately changed. immediately distorted by the one listening, by the mind of the listener, into something that is going to help preserve the false identity, not bring it to an end. Even if the teaching was created for the purpose of bringing the false identity to its final end. Even when it was designed for that purpose, that very instant the listener changes the teaching into something that will preserve the ego illusion. And this has been true for all of human history. But the majority of spiritual teachings, religious and spiritual teachings of the past, were not created by one in whom the illusion of the ego had been brought to its final end. Most of the spiritual and religious teachings of the past were created by one in whom the ego illusion was still continuing. And those teachings were created for the purpose of perpetuating the ego illusion from the beginning, even if the teaching claimed to be for some other purpose. To underestimate the tricks of the ego is, is one of the one of the greatest mistakes made by spiritual aspirants. Just not realizing how clever it is. Of course it isn't going to allow any spiritual teaching to sink in that could bring its false identity to the final end, except in very rare cases. Most spiritual teachings barely even touch upon the deceptive nature of the human mind. Now, when I say barely touch upon, <clears throat> I'm not saying that they don't mention it at all. Yeah, they mention it. But they don't even begin to cover the extent of how deceptive the human mind is. They don't even begin to cover exactly how this false identity has succeeded 
in staying in place for all of human history and for almost every spiritual seeker. They haven't detailed it. They haven't gone into great detail. They haven't been specific. They haven't covered the hundreds and thousands and thousands of ways that the false identity stays in place and the thousands of tricks and strategies that the human mind has to stay in place. They haven't covered that at all. Yeah, they, uh, some of the teachings have mentioned it a little bit. But there's a reason why they haven't gone into that kind of detail. There's a reason why. And that is because those spiritual teachings, almost all spiritual teachings and all religious teachings are serving the false identity. So of course they're not going to go into great detail about the tricks. Why would they go into great detail about the tricks if they're serving the false identity? That would be a contradiction that wouldn't be serving the purposes that the false identity has in mind to be served. To go into great detail of exposing it, that's really the key word, to expose the false identity's tricks, to bring them to light so that they can be seen, to expose them in detail. Not just in general terms, in detail. <clears throat> now, there, there was an exception to this. <clears throat> and the exception to this was Vernon Howard. <clears throat> Vernon Howard spent more than 20 years in his classes going into specific detail exposing the tricks of the false identity, including including the, the tricks that the spiritual seeker uses to continue the, the false identity. He went into detail and in specific detail about thousands of tricks that the false identity uses in his classes over a period of uh, more than 20 years. And he had many classes every week and so there are thousands of hours of recordings where one can hear him exposing these tricks of the false identity. However, most people would find it very difficult to listen to <laughs> for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, <laughs> people, first of all, don't want to have the fault of Indy exposed. Second of all, he didn't do it in a pleasant tone of voice. He did it in a very confrontational manner. And um, the, the books, which are, were quite different, most people would find a lot easier. <coughs> and of all of the Vernon Howard books, when it comes to exposing the ego, uh, the one that I would recommend is called 1500 Ways to Escape the Human Jungle. I'll just repeat that for you. 1500 Ways to Escape the Human Jungle. That's 1500 numbered sentences. And he could say more in one sentence than most spiritual authors can say when they write an entire book in terms of meaning and significance. So, and don't want to spend too much more time on Vernon Howard. I just wanted to acknowledge, yes, there was an exception. There was someone who actually for more than 20 years exposed specifically thousands and thousands of tricks of the ego. Someone has done it. But a teaching that just makes a few vague references to the fact that the human mind is deceptive, that, 
that doesn't serve a whole lot of purpose. Just a very minor purpose. If, if you, the listener, can just see that human beings have been stuck, you don't stay in war for all of human history, stay there, stuck. If you're not stuck, <laughs> you don't have 15,000 wars in the last 5,000 years. You, you wouldn't have a billion acts of violence today as we speak. It couldn't happen without being stuck. Humans are trapped, and they are trapped by something that I'm calling the false identity, but that's not the only way of describing it. There's lots of ways you could describe the false identity. Lots of terms you could put on it. You could call it the ego illusion. You could call it the, the personality. You can call it the human mind. You can call it thousands of layers of self-deception. You can call it thoughts, thinking, ideas, beliefs, concepts. You can call it language, which becomes thought. But humans have been trapped by this for all of human history. And if someone is rare enough to even have the idea that it might be possible to get free of that trap, that trap will keep the trap going. The trap will keep the trap going. The trap doesn't allow that to progress, that thought. If it allows it to arise in the first place, which, by the way, it usually doesn't. <laughs> so if the... If you happen to be uh, lucky enough that somehow you've even seen that the human mind is not who you really are. That thought is not who you are. That thought is something that came from outside. Even to see that as something rare that, that thought usually doesn't allow. But let's suppose one has gone that far. Because after all, If a person is listening to this, they're listening to this for a reason. They and they very well may have. The majority of people aren't going to listen to this. The six billion people on Earth aren't going to. But the the people who do the the recording I made, lesson one, oh, a little more than three thousand people listen to that. But that's not six billion people on Earth, and those people have some interest in what the true identity is, what the true self is, and that sort of thing. So it's possible that a lot of the people listening will have come that far, that so far that they realize that they are not the personality, they are not the human mind, they are not thought, that that is not who or what they are, that who or what they are is something different from that. But even those, even those are going to find that this false identity still has all these thousands of tricks to stay in place. Every single person listening, almost without exception, is going to find this, this false identity is very clever about how to stay in place. How not to be, not to be brought to an end. So, to be aware of that is a good step. It's a good step to be aware, to know that this is going to happen. To know that the, the false identity is going to find ways to stay in place. As I mentioned before, the solution to this is the awakening of the extremely intense desire for freedom, but that really should be a separate subject all, all in itself to go into. But being honest about it, just honest and, and 
if if someone can even see just one time the false identity using some trick to stay in place it might catch it distorting a teaching or interpreting a teaching or changing a teaching or wasting time you know the tell you something important something that's very helpful if you can face the fact that the bodily life is very short and be thankful thankful that you have arrived at a point where you know that there there is another possibility the possibility of, of knowing the true self and to not waste time to view time as something very precious and not waste it. Don't sit there watching television for a couple of hours. You know, that's 120 minutes you just wasted. 120 precious moments. Will you be reborn for 120 million more lifetimes because of those 120 <laughs> minutes? Really get a sense of, a sense of the preciousness of time. But, this is an example of catching the false identity, the false identity, catching it in one of its preservation strategies, wasting time. That covers a lot of, a lot of ground, just, just that term, wasting time. I mean, there's so many different ways one can waste time. You know, a huge number of ways one can waste time. So, it may be a general category, but when you begin to look at it specifically as to how it applies, you can catch the ego in that ego preservation strategy of wasting time. So every time you can catch it, catch it, catch the ego in an ego preservation strategy, that... Uh, that is very helpful. All right. Um, so first of all, Michael, I haven't spoken yet, so I just want to say thank you for letting me come and talk to you today. No, well, thanks for coming. Yeah. Um, at the beginning of this particular audio that we're listening to now, uh, you started with saying things like language is learned from the outside, which of course we all at least intellectually know, although most people do not think about it as they're listening to that voice, right? They don't think about the fact that it's a learned voice. Yeah. Uh, the thought that th thought itself says that it's I, it's me. You talked about how thought wishes to continue. It has millions of tricks, thousands of layers of self-deception. So what I want to do is share with you something that came into my 7 Steps journal. This is my most recent 7 Steps journal. This isn't old. This right. is within the last few days. Mm -hmm. um, I was contemplating, quote, 819. 819 has a phrase in it. It talks about going it says, the real is behind and beyond words. So you can see how that ties into what you were talking about. Yes. So I started uh, looking at words and how words keep me from going behind and beyond words. Yes. And in just a few minutes, I came up with all of these sentences. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is, if I try to meditate, I will just get sleepy. The peacock agrees. <laughs> I don't like meditation. Uh, I am not good at it. Mm -hmm. I am not progressing. Right. I will never be good at meditation. Meditation is a waste of time. Uh, I should spend time with my boyfriend instead of meditating. I haven't worked out in days. Today I need to work out instead of meditating. I can't meditate because I know I will be interrupted. 
So as I looked at these, I really, in fact, I ended by saying, words are good at keeping me from going beyond words. Yeah, and you know what else they are? Those are wonderful, uh, very specific examples of ego preservation strategies. Those are the kinds of thoughts that one uses to prevent awakening. Uh, yeah, are, are, are those exactly. thoughts, yeah. And um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, like, I like the fact that they're very specific examples of, uh, of that. And it's, uh, um, it's good to catch that, to be aware of that. But what's important is to be able to see and not buy into them and believe them, because yes. you could be, uh, most people would would believe those thoughts, and they do follow those thoughts. Um, yeah, I remember in uh, telling the story in the in the book Manonasa about uh, going to see J. Krishnamurti, and this is going to relate to what to to this very specifically because of um, it. it it, it's the thought, what could I be doing other than meditating, you see? And, um, well, you could be having a, a couple of margaritas and cheese enchiladas and rice and beans and having some mariachi serenade you. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Instead of meditating. And then for most people, a couple of margaritas and cheese enchiladas and rice and beans and having mar maranatis, uh, mariachis uh, serenade you is going to be much more appealing than the thought of meditation. That, that, is, that is the nature of the human. And that is the nature of an e ego preservation strategy, which is what all those sentences that you just read are examples of, of how thought preserves itself. By, by that sort of thing. Oh, back to, just back to the really quickly on this Krishnamurti thing. Uh, it's just that, um, so, by sitting there an hour after the talk, contemplating, what did Kri Krishnamurti just say after every other human being had gone? One of the things missed out on were the yummy sandwiches that they served there. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Yeah, yeah very yummy. Yummy, yummy, yummy for the tummy, tummy, tummy <laughs> is what was written in Manonasa, but uh, that's right. And so the, um, and so a question was posed in that book, um, do you think most humans would prefer eternal bliss or a yummy sandwich? And the answer is almost every human being who has ever lived in the history of mankind given a choice between eternal bliss and a yummy sandwich would choose the yummy sandwich. Yes. It is a fact. Because the human mind, that is the way it operates. And some of these sentences in terms of what... You, the the uh, you could be spending time with your boyfriend, yes. for example, would be an example. You you see of uh, of that sort of um, ego preservation strategy. But if you can catch it and not believe it, not believe that it would be better to do something else instead of meditating, not believe that because your meditation might be interrupted that that might be a valid excuse for not doing it, not believe that you're never going to be good at meditation, not believe that uh, that um, it, it that it's a big deal if you do or don't fall asleep during meditation. Uh, the If you don't buy into those ego preservation strategies, and you see them for what they are. You see that they are ego preservation strategies, which means you caught the lie while the lie was being told. You see, that's wonderful, because that doesn't happen too often with humans, really. They just, Regina, humans lie to themselves from the time they wake up in the morning to the time they go to sleep at night. And I want you to know that that was not an exaggeration, that statement. It's not an exaggeration. The human mind itself is a lie. And yes, human beings do it. These, but these are great because it, it, it points out how, what, you know what it points out? It points out what would the ego tell itself in order to get out of having to meditate? Yes. How, how what, what thoughts, what, uh, what ideas would it generate in order not to meditate? Uh, so I like that because it's very, uh, very specific. <laughs> 
Well, and I guess I just want to say, since I don't know who's going to be listening to this, that this is one reason I love contemplating the quotes. Um, I'm not just sitting down and reading quotes and, and saying, yeah, that's a, I like that quote, you know, or I agree with that quote. I use the quotes to look at myself. I use the quotes to uh, deepen my own clarity. Uh, I use the co- quotes to reinforce my desire for awakening, to, to help it to grow. I use the quotes in all of those different ways. Um, and, and, and this is why I love the seven steps to awakening. And I think you also know I can spend hours and hours with one quote. Right. And, and I'll read the quote and I'll write and write in whatever way I'm doing, whether it's looking like this was or whether it's just having the, the inner flame fan so the devotion is getting bigger or whatever it is. I'll, I'll, I'll look at the quote, I'll write and write. But then I always look at the quote again and ask, is there something else here? Yeah. And I can feel inside either, yes, there's something else here, or you're done with this quote, go on to the next one. But I wait until I feel that you're done with this quote, go on right. to the next one. Well, it's good um, for a lot of reasons to do it that way, uh, because if you look upon a quote as a doorway to liberation, then spending an hour with a quote makes a lot of sense. The way spiritual teachings are studied by most humans is a form of entertainment. They find the concepts fascinating and are eager to go to the next one. So, they spend one minute with a quote (laughs) and and move right on to the next quote after one minute that one quote hasn't even had a chance to penetrate one of those thousands of layers of self-deception. It hasn't had any chance at all. But, they're already bored with the one quote, and so they're on to the, you know, some new, more entertaining uh, yeah. uh, uh, concept. Uh, in other words, I- I- if you're finding concepts fascinating, then you you read it like you would a comic book. You want to get on to the next comic or something like that. So, back to the way that you mentioned that you might spend an hour with a quote. Not not that you were you were just using that as an example. That was not a specific time limit that you were placing more or less on a quote. No. It, uh, because as you said, it's when you feel that you, you've gotten everything that needs to get out of it. I have three to five hours with one quote. Sure, sure. So, it, it's not a... It, that was just an example that you were using, but if you're willing to go fully into a quote and just keep the mind on it, then it has a chance. But there is another thing. It's in the very nature of the mechanism that keeps the ego illusion going to move from one thing to another and to not pause and stop. Like thought, for example, thinking, you know, to keep thinking, 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 and to never interrupt the stream. And you've probably heard of this uh, in so many meditative traditions. They've attempted to teach something called one-pointedness, which is if you could just stay focused on just one point without moving, just stay totally focused on one point, well, you can do the same thing with a quote. You see, if, if you have a quote which is a true teaching, if, if you can stay on that true teaching until it's revealed everything that it can reveal to you, then you're, you're doing something very different from what is normally being done. And then, then it's given a, a chance. Thank you. <laughs> Um, the other thing that happens, uh, and, and, and I know you know this, so I want to see if you have anything to say about it. The other thing that happens is during meditation, and I, of course, just like everybody else, have different experiences during meditation. Some days are, are different than other days. That's the way I'm sure it always is. But sometimes um, the mind is so active 
Uh, you know, as soon as you let go of one thought stream, of course, another one comes in. And you let go of that, and then another one comes in. And sometimes I feel a bit lost in the thoughts, and it's as if I can't, it sounds crazy, but it's as if I can't even find the awareness to focus on the awareness. Sure. Because there's so many, so many thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what I do, uh, and you can give me feedback on this, is I just try to relax as much as possible because I feel like right. the, the thoughts are winding and so it seems like the best thing to do is to relax out of the winding. Yes. You can be even, you, you, you can even be very specific with it and just make an attempt to relax thought. In other words, because one could say relax, and it can mean all kinds of things, like relax the body, relax this, re relax that. But you can be very specific about it, and you know, as make it a very make it an exercise, and just if you if you start if you let go of all intention, all effort. And if you let go of thought as it arises, and uh, there's a Zen teacher, uh, forget his name, who talks about opening the hand of thought. You can actually have an experience where it's like a hand is, it's like a hand has been released, where you relaxed thought. Where you relaxed it, you you didn't struggle with it necessarily, or really try to fight it, or do anything like that. You just relax. Yes. So yeah, I would say relax in any way you understand it is great. And uh, um, one way is to relax thought. Another is if you just let go of all intention, all effort, completely. Well, you're not trying to do something, the, but. Um, Oh, there is one more thing I just wanted to say, and that's that um, sometimes it's not good to worry too much about if there's a lot of thought or not a lot of thought. And um, make whatever attempt you can to focus on awareness anyway. Even if you're really, 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 really thinking a lot, not necessarily make that a big problem. In other words, uh, okay, yeah, you're thinking a lot, but you're still going to focus on awareness, even though, you know. And it's true. A human will, a human will, notice that they become lost in thought, and they sort of forgot they were they weren't supposed to be focusing <laughs> on awareness. <laughs> forgot that they. That's what that that. Uh, that was the point of this, you know, and uh, because thought carried them sort of down a stream, yeah. you know, or carried them away or something like that. And I would just say, the moment you become aware of that, focus back on awareness without necessarily trying to make thought less noisy or really give, even getting too involved because in a sense, that's sort of part of thought's trick is to get you in any way involved with it. And worrying about whether there's a lot of thoughts or not too many thoughts is involvement in thought again. It is, is being, it's still being carried. So I would say don't worry too much about if there's a lot of thought, if there's little thought or what it is. Just ignore the thought. Turn the attention away from thought towards the awareness that's observing it whenever you can remember. When thought hasn't carried you so far down that you can't remember. And don't really become too, just ignore thought. Um, it, there's a, I don't remember the exact quote, there's a Muruganar quote, it may be in the seven steps, and it's something like this, it's something like, none can, none can overcome the mind directly. Ignore it as something unreal. And that's just a, another way of saying the same thing, which is just don't get too involved with whether there are many thoughts or few thoughts. Ignore them. Because the whole idea of all of this teaching is to go somewhere other than thought. And so 
at least during meditation, not give it too much significance. There's something else I want to say about that, and that's that uh, I'm saying in meditation, don't give it too much significance. But I'm not saying in daily life, don't give it significance. There are things in daily functioning that you need to use some thought for. And that's a great, great, that's a great misplacing the teaching. Yes. That with an exa one example of how spiritual seekers mis misplace the teaching. I'm, I was, I'm saying in meditation, I wouldn't follow thought, I would ignore thought. But I'm not saying never use thought in daily life. No, no. You know, there are times when thought does need to be used in daily life. And if you're going to use it, you might as well use it in a clear manner and in a skillful manner. Um, so, uh, just didn't want to m misplace that because people listening very well might misplace it and think, uh, oh, ignore thought all the time. No, no, just, but while you're meditating, you know, just ignoring it and not, not being too worried if there's a, a lot of thought or a little thought. Well, and what I find when I, on the days when there's a lot of thought, when thought seems busier, and has a stronger gravity as I as I relax away from it, rest away from it. What seems to happen is that something seems to come up from behind um, that is perfectly still. And once that comes up from behind, that's perfectly still. I can. It's almost like lean back into it. <laughs> And then the thought can talk and talk and talk and talk and the gravity isn't there anymore. So I don't get pulled into it. I don't get lost. I'm able to lean back into the silence that came up from behind. Right. Any comments on that? <laughs> At some point, thought can come to an end. And an accurate description of what remains is silence. But that's a little bit different silence than the silence that you're mentioning. And the reason is this, is because it's like the difference between talking about the peace, <laughs> the peace between two wars <laughs> and calling that peace, and the peace in which war for all of eternity is no longer possible. That's the two different types. You, yes. So that's not the same silence. So is it... Is it worthwhile for me to lean back into that silence? Oh, yes, definitely. Oh, certainly, yeah, because we were talking on the level of practice. Certainly, yeah, that's right, yeah. Definitely, it's worthwhile to lean back into the silence. That's a great... There's nothing better that, that you can do. Lean back or relax or right. rest. Relax into that silence. Yeah, definitely. And I even find myself just simply trusting it. I don't know how to describe that. Like, I think because the mind wants me to get, like you said, worried. Yes. The mind wants me to get worried, which pulls me back in the direction of the mind. So instead of worrying and getting pulled back in the direction of the mind, I trust the silence that's behind me. I trust that it's there. It feels more helpful. Like, one moves me in one direction, yeah. and the other moves me in the other direction. Yeah. To trust that silence, to relax into the silence, is definitely, uh, on the level of practice, is is uh, a great thing to do and practice is what's important. So that's uh, concluding our first yes. uh, one hour recording and uh, Regina and I will uh, continue on uh, other spiritual topics uh, on uh, the next recording. All right, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> this is Michael Langford and Regina Dawn Akers 
Recording number one. If you hear silent pauses during this recording, please use the time to reflect on what has been said. I want to begin by talking about the human mind. And by human mind, I mean thought. 